All right, here we go. Today we have legendary Brooklyn rapper Special Ed. And to explain how special this interview is, Ed is the first rapper I ever interviewed in my life. Amen. It was 2002, and I had just moved to New York to pursue my dreams of being a DJ. I was working on a hip-hop book at the time, and Ed invited me into his home to interview him about it. The book never came out, but that interview set me on a path that would forever change my life. So thank you, Ed, for giving me, for giving someone who you've never heard of before a chance to sit down with you 21 years ago. Amen. I appreciate that, man. And, um, you know, just we, we, we got to pass on opportunities to others. We got to grant others opportunities if we're able to. And, you know, a friend had called, you know, someone that I respected and said that, you know, I got a guy that wants to come uh, to your house and interview you. And, you know, I never did cribs or none of those shows. I never let nobody in my house. Mm. It was real private and personal for me. But I said, you know what? As long as he just come and shoot right here <laughs> against this wall, I ain't got no problem with it. And everything worked out, man. You know, you came through. It was cool. Everything was respectful. And, um, you know, it was it was a good experience for me. I never let nobody else back in my house. I tell you that. So that was one of a kind and one and on a one time. So, yeah, this is a 360 right here coming back around. Oh, yeah. It's a full circle, man. And now I actually have a real platform because that interview never came out because the book ended up getting canceled and right. so forth. It was called Chicken Soup for the Hip Hop Soul. It never came out. Uh, I even got dropped off that team and the whole thing got canceled afterwards. But <laughs> now this is going to come out. And right. now millions of people are going to watch it. Amen. And congratulations, man, just on sticking in, sticking it out and continuing with your passion and finding your passion because, you know, obviously it was your first one, so you didn't know that that was going to be your thing. But, you know, here we are 20-something years later, and you the man. So there you go. <laughs> Thank you, man. You've been the man the whole time. So Appreciate you. All right, so our first interview. I want to start in the very beginning. Born and raised in Brooklyn. Off of Flatbush. Yes, sir. 21 Fairview Place. Yes, sir. 21 Fairview Place. Yes, sir. That's where I grew up. Okay, and you had Jamaican parents. Yes, my family's all from Jamaica, even my four brothers. And I have one that's one year older, and he was also born in Jamaica. So really it was during the time of um, citizenship when you're born in the country. So that was kind of like our gateway, our pathway into, you know, citizenship. Okay, so your parents had your four brothers in Jamaica, then they moved over here, and then your mom got pregnant and had you. Yeah, well, she was already pregnant. <laughs> okay. <Just> keep <laughs> she it real. Pregnant. Keep it 1,000. This was our ticket to civilization coming got from it. a third world country. Mm -hmm. As many immigrants uh, seek. You know what I'm saying? So those were the laws back then, the immigration laws. She came here and had me, and that allowed us to be able to stay. Right. You know, and then you we guys settled there, you know, in Flatbush, which is a very Jamaican area. Yeah, Flatbush. And I tell you, uh, aside from just Jamaican, it was very culturally diverse because on my one block that I grew up on, on the corner there was a white family that existed there from you know, the previous eras. Then across the street, we had black American family. Down the block we had on the other corner, we had the African family. We had the Puerto Rican family that were business owners. We had a Haitian family that rented an apartment to a Dominican family across the street. They had a two family home. So we had a lot of different diverse cultures on every block, but my block was just one example, you know what I'm saying, of how many diverse cultures there were. Well, your four older brothers, you had mentioned at one point that they got into some trouble. Yeah, we all just, it was, we were a troublesome bunch, so to speak. We are good hearted, but you know, unfortunately we were in a community where police are very active and you know, the people are very active. So we get caught up in things just like everyone else. And the police are quick to, you know, arrest you, harass you, abuse you, <laughs> and all that stuff. Well, you had mentioned that before you even got a record deal, you had a pistol, an illegal one, but you never used it. 
Correct. So so what was the point of a, a teenager having a pistol? And obviously you have very strict Jamaican parents that weren't weren't down for that. So so what was the reason why you felt you needed to protect yourself at that point in your life? Well, for one, it was a gift. And I, you know, I accept gifts. For two, protection. We grew up in a very, you know, risky type atmosphere, risky neighborhood. You know, a lot of stick up kids, a lot of gangs. Um, just a lot of crime, period. So it was a means of ensuring safety and, um, you know, protection, just protection against the, the uh, circumstances that we lived in. Well, right. You're talking about Brooklyn, Flatbush in particular in the early to mid 80s. That's when crack is starting to hit and all the craziness that came with that. I mean, during that era of your life, what do you think was the craziest thing that you ever experienced or saw? Man, I've seen a lot of things um, just being solicited to buy all kinds of shit. <laughs> it was an open market, flea market in the streets. Just um, seeing the crimes being committed on both ends. Uh, two of my best friends got locked up basically on kingpin charges like right before I came out. You know what I'm saying? For weight. And um, one of them was like one of my best friends. He used to take his ring off and give it to me so I could make the beats when I battle people, you know what I'm saying? So it was like a thing where I would make my own beat and rhyme at the same time. So shout outs to Kevin Kane, man, you know. Um, and they home now, you know, living productive lives, but they got tied up for, for, for football numbers. I mean, football numbers, as a 15 or 14 year old? As a teenage, yeah. They were slightly older than me. So when I was 15, he was probably 16. His brother was probably 18, 19. And um, yeah, they were a little bit older than me. Uh, I grew up mostly around older heads. Like my brothers were older, so my level of maturity and the people that I wanted to be around were either my age or older. Yeah, I mean, it's wild. You and I are in our 50s now. To think about the dumb shit that we've done as teenagers or in our early 20s and to make a mistake that could cost you football numbers, a big chunk of your life. Absolutely. Just seems so crazy. You know, I've, I've told the story that, you know, in my 20s, I, I bought a kilo of cocaine and got ripped off for it. And, you know, I mean, I, I was thinking, I remember when I interviewed Freeway Ricky Ross and I mentioned that. And he said, well, if you didn't get ripped off for it. You could have gone to prison for 20 years. That's right. And I'm like, oh, shit, I never thought of it that way. I'm thinking about the 17,000 I lost. But right. but look at the time that I gained That's from, right. from, from it not working. And, and the lesson you learn. The lessons I learned. I never touched that shit again. But here your friends are at 17 years old doing the same stuff, but they get caught. And then suddenly their life is completely different. Yeah, and they got they got bagged up in South Carolina. So there was probably some jealousy going on. Somebody snitched on them, and um, they got it. They got them. You and Buster Rhymes went to elementary school together. Absolutely. Myself, uh, was he, Buster Rhymes. Was he even rapping back then? Or, Klepto. Or nothing? Nah, he wasn't rapping back then. Okay. Got it. Now, you yourself, you know, hip-hop was still new during this time. Uh, Jimmy Spicer was a big influence for you. Absolutely. What made you say, okay, I, I'm i not just going to be a hip-hop fan. I'm actually going to try to work the craft myself. Well, a big part of that is Howie T. Because I was physically able to see that it was not only possible, but it was happening right down the street. Even though I heard rumors of Jimmy Spicer living in the area, and passing through Flatbush, my family lived across the street from Howie T. So when we visited them, oftentimes I would get the opportunity to actually see them getting busy. CD3, uh, Howie T, you know, Count Disco, um, he had a whole crew. And they used to have the turntables outside with the mics kind of passing it around, making these mixtapes. And I got to see that as a child and I was impressed. I was like, wow, 
I, you know, I hear the music, I hear mixtapes, but to actually see them doing it was a whole nother thing for me. It was like made it very real. So that really inspired me to want to do it more than anything. You know, I would, you know, just get that credit to Howie T and being hands on and physically present while they were doing these things. And I'm talking about, you know, 70s, late 70s, you know, early 80s. Well, yeah, for those that don't know, Howie T went on to do Want to Sex You Up by Color Me Bad, which yeah. became a number one hit. Uh, Treat Him Right by Chub Rock and a whole bunch of other really dope yeah, songs. Yeah, Chub Rock, he did UTFO, he did Whistle, he did Little Sean, he did Puma. He did um, a bunch of Brooklyn artists, Izzy Ice. Like, he did some hits there, man, for a lot of Brooklyn artists, man. He was one of the uh, super producers, as they say, you know, coming out of Brooklyn. Okay, and your real name is Edward. Yeah. And that's how you came up with Special Ed. Yeah, everybody but called me Eddie back then and Ed. So uh, a friend of mine, Eric Eric Green, was like, you should call yourself Special Ed. You know, because it kind of complemented almost my energy, you know, because, you know, Special Ed kids had a lot of energy. <laughs> But then my name was Ed, you know, and I thought about it for two seconds because I was never in special ed. But then I thought about it and I was like, well, you know what? I could have an effect on the way people view that name or, you know, perceive that conceptually. So I was like, you know, I can change some things around and I could teach them something. You know what I'm saying? Set an example. I mean, right, but special ed also means mentally disabled to a certain degree. So, but, you know, but then again, people were saying, let's get retarded and stuff like that. So I think is was yeah. it sort of a play off of that in a way? A little bit of a play, but I don't think, in my eyes, it wasn't really mentally retarded because I knew kids in special ed and just being a student, I knew that it was not all special needs where they were all in that spectrum. Some of them were just had behavioral issues. Some of them were misunderstood and intentionally placed there because the teachers just didn't want to deal with them. You know, so that was really my perspective on the thing. It was like, you know, I felt like there was a whole generation of kids that they just didn't want to deal with, you know, they because of their behavior or their mentality or the way they spoke out and, you know, were outspoken. You know, when you don't answer questions right, when you don't go by the status quo, automatically they kind of put you to the side. I was in a program called Operation Success, which was um, where they removed me from the general population of the school and put me in a smaller group that was in a way similar, but not, you know, special needs. We went off to like a business and trade school in Manhattan for a while, studied, and that's where I learned accounting. You know, first they had us all in a jewelry making class, and then they went as far as to extract me from that group of teenagers and put me in an accounting class with a bunch of old people. And I'm saying everybody in that class had gray hair, and I was a high school teenager, and I was like, well, why are they taking me out of here and putting me in here? And I think it might have been just because of my um, my aptitude, my, my ability to comprehend and uh, process information. And at the end of the day, it worked out because I just came fresh out of that um, accounting course when I got into this record deal. So my accountant was immaculate. <laughs> <laughs> well, before the record deal, and this is the one memory that still sticks out from our interview 20 some years ago. Yeah. You were telling me about how, you know, you were rapping in school and you were battling people and stuff like that, but then you performed a song called The Bush. Yes. Amen. So that's when I really decided to take it to another level. We had a, a what do they call it? It was a concert, a talent show at Erasmus Hall High School. And, you know, Erasmus was one of the worst schools in Brooklyn. 
I mean, kids uh, or people my age definitely know about E Hall and the reputation. And um, it was one of the, it was a school of the arts now, but it was also a school right in the hood. And um, it was crime ridden. Anyway, they had a talent show and I decided to rap in the talent show because I was already popular as an MC in the school. So my boy, Richie Rich, uh, he called himself Poe Rich now, but he was beatboxing for me. We didn't have any music or anything. This was just straight beatboxing and rapping. And when uh, we went up there, it was my time to shine. You know, it was a few of us. And when I came to do my thing, I did the bush. And when I started that and I said, the bush, the bush, the crowd got up, went nuts in the spot. And I was like, I felt the energy. I was like, man, I got to do this. I have mm -hmm. to do this because this is this is it. If I can get this response from a crowd that has never heard me before. And as I mean, as far as a record or a performance of that, you know, magnitude, They've heard me in the arch battling, battling people. They knew I was nice. I get some laughter and jeers. But this was actual like crowd participation and, and uh, you know, making noise for your boy. So I was like, I felt that energy. And that's what really pushed me to say, I could probably do this for real, for real. And um, seeing the success of Run DMC was one of the biggest inspirations because before them, it was kind of like a dream of, you know, of of uh, even getting there. But when you saw some guys from Queens and they were doing uh, videos in helicopters and had the big rope chains and Adidas sponsorships and doing Madison Square Garden, like being on the Fresh Fest was one of my goals. You know what I'm saying? I was like, man, I want to be on a fresh fest. I want to be on a fresh fest. So that pushed me. Okay, so you hook up with Howie T. Yep. And uh, you rap for him, and he instantly was like, okay, let's do this. Absolutely. Went into his basement, and um, he said, well, what you want to rap to? I, I said, impeach the president. Because I was familiar with break beats, and really through my DJ action. Because in junior high school, in the, in eighth grade, DJ Action had turntables, a mixer, a microphone, and speaker cabinets that he built in the eighth grade. He had them all ready when I went to his house. So I was impressed. And we spent a lot of time in Act Crib rhyming to break beats. Act had break beats, too. So all of that in itself, this was all like some anomaly shit because... How he get all that in eighth grade <laughs> was beyond me. And have not just the break beats, but the skill level to support me rhyming. Like I literally pick up the mic and could spit and perform while Ak was DJing. So in the eighth grade. So and we were both, you know, in the eighth grade. So that in itself to me was just like signs, all clear signs. And then knowing how we we went to Howie and um, I said, yeah, give me impeach the president. And he was like, all right. He looped it up real quick. And then I started spitting, man. I tore it up like I I, I probably went through every rhyme I had until they told me to stop. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I did not stop because I wanted to make sure that I got on because UTFO Roxanne Roxanne had just came out around those times. You know, and, and that was a big record. He, he got really big from that. You know, he did some stuff with Chubb and Sean and Puma and, you know, but and Whistle, UTFO and Whistle. He just finished their projects. And uh, he was like, yeah, we can do it. Let's do it. OK, so now you're working with a super producer who lives across the street from you. And you from guys my cousins. are putting together your project. Yeah. How long after that? Did you end up signing the deal with Profile Records? Okay. First, he lived across the street from my cousins. Okay. So it's my when, so it, which was not far, maybe 10, 12 blocks from my house. So I used to walk over there, go visit them. And that's when I got to see how we at work. But um, after we recorded like maybe four songs, maybe five, six songs, that's when we got a deal. 
um, there was a group of guys that played football together called True Blue. You know, they call themselves True Blue Entertainment and they, you know, profess to be managers. So one day when I was in Howie's crib, they came into the basement and was like, look, you know, we interested in managing you. And I said, well, you know who you manage. So they managed, I believe at the time, Chubbs and some of Howie's people. And, you know, with all due respect, I was like, well, that's cool, but this is what I can agree to. If you go get me a record deal, I'll sign with you and the record deal at the same time. So that's that was my way of agreeing, but giving them a chance to prove themselves because I didn't know them, you know, but they were from the neighborhood and um, they represented a few artists. Okay, and at the time, Profile Records had Run DMC, who you looked up to. Exactly. So, so that was that kind was of a it. full circle moment for yeah, you right exactly. there. Exactly. So all of these things were signs for me. And um, that was another sign. When they said Profile Records was interested, I was like, hell yeah, they have one of the biggest groups in rap, period. I think Run DMC, to me, was the epitome of rap. They had reached the plateau that hip hop was at at that point. You know, they they went to Def Jam and Def Jam uh, felt like I was too young and they actually wanted to buy some of my records for other artists. And I was like, nah, I'm good. And, and I got, they said Profile was interested and they were willing to go through the process because they had to go through a lengthy court process in order to legally sign me to any agreement. Right, because you were 15 at the time. Yes, I was 15. So they couldn't sign me without going to court. Def Jam didn't want to do the work. They didn't want to go to court. They just wanted to buy some songs from me. And I was like, nah. <laughs> but I always loved Def Jam and wanted to be a part of Def Jam because it was like supposedly the first independent successful uh, label. And then just being down with Rush, that was a big thing back then. You know what I'm saying? And I thought that they could have brought my career to great heights, but so could Profile, you know? So that's what I decided to go with it. Run DMC, say less. Okay, so you signed a deal with Profile. Do you remember, did you get an upfront check at that point or no? Yeah, uh, the first album check was probably like 15,000, which, you know, Sounded like a lot back then. I had no idea of any of the numbers or there were no standardizations. There was no go-to number or figure that you would expect. I just wanted the opportunity to do what Run DMC did. I just wanted to have the same type of videos. I just wanted to be on the Fresh Fest. I wanted to gain that, what looked like success to me, you know, and I'd imagine that they had great financial success as well. From the looks of everything, they were on top of the game. Okay, so you signed a profile records and now you got to finish up your album. Correct. Now, I Got It Made was an early record. I guess you even worked it out before you met Howie T? Oh, yeah. I, I had... um well, not with the beat, but I had those rhymes, a lot of those rhymes already. I did write rhymes for the album, but for the most part, I took a lot of the lyrics and rhymes that I had written previously and put them together by subject matter into different songs. Whether I was telling a story, whether I was bragging, whether it was something conscious or subconscious, you know, I just put things together in that manner. Well, look, I got it made. Well, that was my introduction to you, which I think for the rest of the world also, you know. Right, that was the first you, single. In your particular area. But that beat, I mean, Nori said it, and I'll co-sign it, one of the best hip-hop beats of all time. Amen. Shout outs to Howie T, all the praises do. Howie was an innovator. Um, I know a lot of people claiming, especially with this 50th of hip hop, a lot of people claiming to have done this and invented this and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, 
Howie T. Howie T, the legend, the producer, the innovator, and actually the way he uh, processed the sample is how it came to sound that way. And no one can duplicate it. You have to sample my record. If you sample the original sample, it's going to sound like the Kid and Play version. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Kid and Play. <laughs> Man, look, like, uh, no, I mean, just the the rhymes in that song. Yeah. You know, like like the way you put it together, When I, I was thinking about the rhymes today. Uh, I make fresh rhymes daily. You burn me? Really? Right. Daily and really don't really rhyme, but you made it rhyme. <laughs> right. Well, you see what I I'm think, saying? Yeah, I think that has a lot to do with me understanding language and different dialects and um, just different cultures and how they speak. You know, even even in Jamaican Patois, how things are pronounced. And um, yeah, and just kind of putting a little humor in it as well. I plug different stuff. Like I used to have little rhymes with little slogans, commercial stuff, you know, just little plugs of stuff to make you be like, oh, that's funny. I, my goal was to entertain myself. So when I wrote, if I was entertained, I knew that others would be entertained as well. So that was my goal. I had to impress myself when I wrote. I mean, when you made, I got it made. Did you know that was a hit or is it just another song that you're trying to hurry up and get out and go on to the next one? Nah, I felt like that was a hit. I felt like they were all hits, really, to be honest. The only song I'm going to be honest that I, I wasn't really feeling and I'm glad he did a remix and Howie is the king and originator of remixing everything. I don't care what nobody talking about. Howie T, once again, I'm going to give him all his props. But The Magnificent, because he did it originally on that reggae beat, and it was okay, but I felt it was a little too springy for the lyrics. And then when he did the remix, I was like, okay, yeah, I'm feeling that a little better right there, because those were some lyrics. Those were some hard lyrics and at the time. It was just a matter of it fitting on the right track. But sometimes I just left it up to Howie, like, okay, a lot of times I sat there and dug through the crates with him and picked out the samples and put the tracks together with him and all that. But sometimes I just took beats he had or he wanted me to rap on. He'd suggest, yo, check this out. I'd be like, all right, that's hot. If I saw he was excited about it, I'd do it, period. You know what I'm saying? Just out of homage, like, the man put me on, like... And he knows sound, he knows music, so I just took his judgment for gospel, you know? Okay, so the album comes out, Youngest in Charge. Number 73 on Billboard, number 8 on the R&B hip-hop chart. Uh, it initially goes gold, right? Allegedly. So the problem is that what I didn't know that I found out the hard way was that Run DMC wasn't very happy and none of the artists were as happy as I might have thought. Um, they were their own record label. They were their own manufacturer and they were their own distribution company. So they probably had three sets of books, if not more. So what happened was in my contract is there were bumps in the royalties for every goal. So when we reached goal, there was a bump. If we reached platinum, there was another bump, which would increase the percentage that I got paid. So theoretically and allegedly, I was at like 480 something from almost the beginning, the first year. And they never passed 500, technically. So they didn't have to give me an increase in my royalties like they paid me my royalties anyway. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So they just like, they doubled down on everything. It was kind of disrespectful. But, you know, I just continued on with my career and with my pursuit of getting my bread. Okay, and that album had a few other singles. It had Think About It and I'm the Magnificent, which you already mentioned. Yeah. And I remember another part of our original conversation 20 years ago, 
you and I talked about how, you know, these days, uh, these albums that come out, they have a whole bunch of different producers. They have a whole bunch of features, this and that. But back then, it wasn't like that. It was like, yo, this is my joint. I want it to be all me. And I want to have one producer do the whole thing. And this is our work of art that the, the two of us have created. Correct. And that's how it was always like that. Like, we, there weren't really many collaborations between other artists at that time. Everyone was almost selfish and wanted to prove a point and show that they were the best, you know? And um, I had, you know, I was on some loyalty. Howie T was the one that put me on, gave me the hit tracks, and I didn't want to just jump around to different producers. I remember I was on tour one time and um, JD, Jermaine Dupree, he was a DJ for Silk Times Leather. And he gave me a cassette with some beats. And I I appreciated it, but I kind of looked at him like, I got a producer already. You know what I'm saying? Not thinking to collaborate, not thinking to work with other producers and other people. I was just thinking like, okay, I, I took it. I took the cassette. I, I, I appreciated it. I loved, you know, I always show people respect, you know what I mean? Especially when they're excited about what they're presenting to you. You know, I always had respect. And I got a lot of demos, a lot of different stuff from different artists. I remember I got Bahamadia's uh, demo back in the days and I loved it. I listened to it, you know what I'm saying? And um, so I never threw anything away. I always kept it. I always respected people's art. But like I said, when JD gave me the tape, I was like, well, I got Howie T. That was my, you know, feeling. Me at the time, so just grasping the concept of working with other people was like, for what? You know, we got yeah. the chemistry. And what's, what's wild, no, no disrespect to Howie T at all, but JD would become a much bigger producer over time. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. JD has probably sold hundreds of millions of records at this point, right. whereas Howie has sold millions. You know what I'm saying? Correct. So it's like, who would have known at the time, but had you taken JD up on that offer, who knows where your career could have potentially gone? Right. And, but, you know, it was the culture at the time and me being on profile records. I don't think it was a, a um, production thing. I think it was more of where we were with the culture and being – dedicated or loyal to our home teams. You know what I mean? So, yeah, shout outs to JD and all that. Great job. Well, although you weren't getting the money you deserved from Profile, you were making money and you were getting show money. And I guess you bought two co-op apartments with the money early on? Yeah, when I turned 18 and I was able to do a legal purchase, I uh, did a simultaneous closing on two condo units uh, in this place called King's Village over in all uh, like Old Mill Basin near to Canarsie in Brooklyn. Just, you know, but this is the funny part, though. The unit I had was, a I, well, I had two units, but I was only going to live in one. So the unit I was going to live in, it had a pool view, right? And it was right out the window. I was on the fourth floor and there was a pool right outside there. So after I closed and moved into the building, the pool closed and never opened back up. <laughs> they turned it into a parking lot in a CVS. I was disgusted. I was like, yo, I'm ready to get it on. I'm thinking, oh, it's going to be lit. It turned into like a, a parking lot. I'm like, bro. <laughs> But the units did uh, accrue in value, and I did make some good money off of those units. So, you know, it's good and bad and everything. <laughs> All right. So, 1990, yeah. you put out your sophomore album, Legal, which is a reference to you turning 18. Right. 84 on Billboard, 15 on the R&B hip-hop charts, and the big song on there was The Mission. The Mission, yeah. Yep. Yeah which samples the Mission Impossible theme song. Yeah, well, you know, we didn't sample it. Actually, Spanador from Cult Jam, he played it over. And I feel, we, me and Howie felt terrible about missing his credit on that 
uh, on the label thing, but Spanador came and he worked with Howie too. You know, they were all friends and um, he came in there and, and played the, the James Bond chords and um, it came out quite well. But um, the, the truth be told, that wasn't the original mission. And this is a part of my experience with, uh, you know, explicit lyrics. I had a mission, the original mission um, was a story about me and Action Love going to get revenge on a dude in the hood. And we kind of ran up on his crew, you know, open fire, this, that, and the third. He wasn't there. We ran him down, chased him, found his girl, slapped her up. And <laughs> he came in the picture and then we caught him. So that was the original mission. And the label shut that down. The label was like, we can't put this record out. And we like, wow, this shit is dope. <laughs> but they were like, you know, that's not the image we want to portray. And we want something that we can actually get played on the radio. So I had to respect that right and then i went back and rewrote a whole nother story a whole nother mission and um that's where the mission part two became part one <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah okay so so this album you know does does well also now uh, malcolm jamal warner who played Theo on the Cosby show. Which music videos was he directing during this time? Yeah, he directed The Magnificent and okay. Come On, Let's Move It. Aha. Uh -huh. Both of those right. videos. Yeah, so he okay. had just got into, you know, directing and um, he wanted to do some, some hip hop videos. And I was like, yeah, that's a great look. Yeah, let, let, let him, you know, jump in. Okay, and he was on the Cosby show by this point. Yeah, he was big. He was a big star on TV. And he wanted to get, and I know he was directing some Cosby stuff. He was becoming more of a director. So he just wanted to venture over into hip hop due to his love of hip hop. And um, I was like, cool, let's get, go for it. You know what I'm saying? Okay, and that relationship actually got you a cameo on The Cosby Show, which at the time was the biggest show in the world. Yeah, Cosby Show was super big, and um, it it definitely helped. I don't I don't think that it was like a sure thing. I mean, we'd have to ask Malcolm if he had the juice like that. But we we got directed to the fact that they wanted a hip hop artist to play a little part, you know, like a cameo role. And um, I went down there and I had to do the reading. I had to go through the process, so it wasn't just like oh you know, jump in here. It was more so like, hey, there's an opportunity here. Why don't you see if, um, you know, you can get this role? And I actually got it. They, they you know, kind of was feeling me. And I went in and did that. And that was great. My guy, um, Chill, was in that episode with me. And um, Alan Payne is his name. He was He was in that with me. And it was pretty cool. Okay, so was there around this time that you met Tupac while out on tour? Um, yeah, yeah. Shortly after that, um, I was introduced to him through Latifah's crew. You know, I was dating one of her dancers at the time. And, um, you know, they used to hang out. They used to do shows with Digital Underground and tour with them. And um, there was times that we would tour together as well. I guess that's how we ended up so close. I remember we had a tour one time and we shared, uh, I shared my bus with them. And, um, you know, we became, we all became close. I tell you, back then, even though there was competition, there was more love and camaraderie than anything. Like, just for us all to have the opportunity to be out there as celebrities and hip hop artists touring and making money and having hit records. I think we all just, you know, um, befriended one another and gravitated to one another. It wasn't as much animosity and beefs and that sort of thing. We were all truly, genuinely happy for each other. So that's how I met Pac. 
And um, he was a roadie for Digital Underground at the time. So it was really just like outside of the show, off the stage, off camera, we all just kind of chilled out and joked around, smoked, whatever, drank. You know, that's when I used to drink OE, <laughs> sitting like that, you know, as an adolescent. Yeah, I mean, you and Pac became actual friends, though, yes, from that whole experience. Absolutely. Yeah, we became friends and we just kind of communicated with each other. If I went out to the West Coast, I'd hit him up and he'd come hang out with me. And um, one time I remember I was in L.A. I didn't realize he lived in the Bay. So I'm like, yo, what's up? I'm in Cali. He's like, where you at? I'm like, I in, I'm in, I was staying at the Brentwood Suites. We had did a gig up by, I think, UCLA. And um, I was like, he was like, oh, man, that's all the way in L.A. He's like, I'm going to come fuck with you, though. Give me a minute. So I was like, where, how far are you? He was like, you know, in the Bay. I really didn't put two and two together. I didn't know the terrain. So he ended up coming all the way from the Bay. Some people had rode out and dropped them off. And he was just chilling with me. And um, we actually went and did some, um, I had did some retail that day. And then we wanted to go out. So I called this lady that we had met at the retail spot and she took us out and uh, to this party. And we actually went to a party that uh, I think, I don't know whose release it was. It might've been D Barnes release because that was the party that uh, Dre had an incident with D Barnes. So Tupac right. and myself was standing outside the front because the party was kind of weak. It wasn't like you know, a lot of people, it wasn't hype. It was really kind of like a, a mellow Hollywood type of party. So we outside on the wall smoking a Newport and up pulls Dre and a bunch of dudes and they all jumped out and ran up in the party. And we just looking at each other like, shit, ain't nobody in there. <laughs> and then, you know, maybe like four minutes later, they all came running back out. And I was like, I figured that, like, ain't nothing up in there. It's kind of dead. Uh, that's why we was outside. So they kind of jumped out, jumped out and left and kind of peeled out. And, um, yeah. So, and then we found out or figured out after the fact that something had transpired. But, um, you know, at that time, we was just chilling, hanging out. He didn't know Dre. I didn't even know Dre at that time. I'd seen him before but I didn't know him personally. Well, yeah, I mean, prior to that, that's when Ice Cube had left the group and Dee Barnes had her own show. She interviewed NWA. She also interviewed Ice Cube and Ice Cube took some shots at NWA and Dr. Dre. So Dr. Dre showed up and I guess kicked Dee Barnes down some stairs or something. That's, that's tough. I don't know exactly what happened because like I said, we were outside. But, you know... I think that, you know, just tension and the tension that was created from all of that and the problems that arose from that, you know, could have been prevented. Everyone makes mistakes. I'm sure that uh, Dre and D has resolved their issues a long time ago. Yeah. And, um, you know, even though the story lingers, everybody make mistakes. You know, we all do shit that we're not too proud of. So, you know, yeah, but that happened and I was actually there with Pac that time and um when that when that took place. And it always kind of uh dawned on me like when he went back to death row and was working with Dre and all that stuff, if he, you know, thought about that or discussed that at all with Dre, because it was just ironic that we was chilling together at that party when that happened. Well, you went on to do some beats for Tupac. Uh, on the Strictly album, you did Guess Who's Back. Right. And, you know, that album was sort of the point where Tupac actually blew up because, you know, his first album, you know, Brenda's Got a Baby was a powerful song, but it never really took off. Right. I, I Get Around was on that second album, and that was his first hit record. So you got to be a part of Tupac's kind of blowing up. In a way. Right. Well, he came and said that he was doing another album. If we had any tracks, you know, 
And um, at that time, the production team was basically me and DJ Action. Before the Dollar Cab Lab and I invited other or other of my homies to produce with us. It was me and DJ Action. So shout outs to DJ Action. Um, so yeah, we did the Guess Who's Back track. And um, oh no, Strictly For My Niggas. Yeah, that was Guess Who's, no, that wasn't Guess Who's Back. No, no, Yeah, Guess that was Back Guess was Who's the Back. the song, Strictly was the album. That's right, that's right. I remember because we did another one later, but yeah, and um, it was cool, you know. It got on the album, it did well, and um, you know, we was proud of him. It wasn't a thing like trying to jump on the record or do a collab. I was happy for my man getting his opportunity. And, you know, I st stuck into my role as a producer, you know, and, and we gave him the track. That one was mostly act on that track there. And, um, you know, I did the, you know, I, I was contributed uh, and um, did the hook and all that good stuff too, you know. Well, you also did a song on Are You Still Down, but I couldn't figure out what song that was. Open Fire. Open Fire. Okay. Yeah. So Open Fire, we did years prior and they didn't use it on the album, you know, because he was doing so many songs then they just picked what they picked. But um, after he passed, they were seeking, you know, unreleased songs. And it was a great song. So, you know, they came to us and negotiated uh, a deal for it. And we was like, cool. For for the most part, after his passing, I was really not interested or concerned with financial gain from one of my deceased friends. I more so wanted to contribute to his legacy and ensure that he had, you know, whatever good music was out there. So, you know, Open Fire was the name of that one. Uh, okay. And in 92... Well, you actually auditioned for Juice. Mm -hmm. You didn't get it. Right. But then you went to go hang out with Tupac while they were filming Juice. Right. And he got you the role. Absolutely. And I really didn't ask him to. I didn't even know what was going on. I just explained to him that I had read for the movie and didn't get it, you know, and then found out, you know, they gave it to the other curly hair dude. And, um, he took that and, and didn't really say much. He just got up like maybe he had something to do. And he was like, yo, I'll be right back. And then when he came back, he was like, yo, Ed, I got you a little role. It ain't, you know, a big role, but it's a little something. And I was like, man, you ain't had to do that, bro. But I, I appreciate it. You know what I'm saying? That's my boy. Like, that's what you would do for your friend. You know what I'm saying? Especially if you have the 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 pull to do it, the juice. You know what I'm saying? If he knew that he could do that or make that happen, that was good, man. That was love. But it was never really my intent to do any of that. After I didn't get the role, I didn't get the role. We was just chilling. But um, yeah, that, I mean, that movie was sort of like the first kind of hip hop cameo movie, I feel. Because, I mean, not only was Pac in it, but Queen Latifah was in it. Yeah. Um, Tretch was in it. You're in it. So right. as a hip hop head, we're all watching. going like, oh, shit, that's that rapper. Oh, that's that rapper. Right, oh, shit. Right. Like that's, you know, it was like... As a real hip hop fan, everyone kind of got it. Yeah, I think that was the evolution from the music video era to how many artists can we put in a movie, you know? And um, it's, it was a, a a fan base type of thing where it was like, oh, this one, oh. So you'd get the reactions in the theater when our different artists come on the screen. So, you know, it was a good idea to sell uh, tickets and push a movie. And they had a few more come out like that where they just, you know, a lot of cameos and popular artists, you know, ways to sell a movie. Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people, like, for example, the Hughes brothers, when I interviewed them, they said that once Juice came out, Pac saw the reaction to the Bishop character and sort of adopted that persona and internalized it and kind of, you know, became a slightly different person. When I picked him up from Burbank Airport, I think Mo Prime was there too. And we went to the Paramount lot to see Juice. I didn't know what we were going for. My brother was there. And I think Karen Lee, his publicist, was there as well. What I didn't know at the time, Vlad, was he had heard the reviews. He knew that he was getting 
high marks for his performance. He was the breakout star thing of that film. Yeah, clearly. So he sat there, and I think what people get wrong about when they say Tupac changed, when he saw Juice, I think he saw the blueprint. And I think he saw the, oh, this is how I'm going to get what I'm after. Mm. You know, people will listen to this. People Bishop. will hear that. They'll, they'll hear Bishop. Yeah. They'll see Bishop. Knowing him the way you did before that, do you think that's accurate or no? I think that a lot of people probably tested him more. I think mm. he probably came across more situations where people want to test your gangster because of you playing that role. It's almost like if you make gangster records, you gonna meet some gangsters and they gonna come see if you really gangster. You can't avoid that. So it's going to, you know, you're going to be tested. And I think that him playing that role, not just made him famous, but made him famous in that way as that, particular type of energy. So you got more gangsters wanting to befriend you, wanting to test you, and wanting to just kind of see if you are who you are or who you were on screen. You know what I'm saying? But he was the same person when I spoke to him or when we chilled. But I think that out in the public, people perceived him as such and situations probably came out of that. I mean, people going to test your gangster when you play a gangster. I mean, I've heard a lot of stories that never made the news about Tupac. I remember talking to uh, someone I know named Adisa who went to go interview him and then in front of the studio, a bunch of guys rolled up and started shooting at him and then he pulled out his gun and started shooting back at him. And these are stories that, you know, before he got really famous that no one knows about. So, you hanging out with them, were there any sort of crazy situations that never hit the news? Um, well, not while he was famous, because those times he just came to my studio to record. He would bring his whole crew with him. They'd be up in the studio just kind of recording. But prior to that, like the time he came to L.A., uh, the person that the lady that took us out and drove had this old Scooby-Doo looking van. Right. So we in the Scooby Doo looking van and we were headed back to the hotel. Now, for some reason, the lady passes the hotel and me and Pot looking at each other like, yo, the hotel is right over there. So she's talking about there was some dudes behind us. Like f following us or something. And Pac was like, man, pull this fucking van over, man. Pull into the gas station. We getting out. And he was like, I don't want to hear that shit, man. I'm from the West Coast, this, that, and the third. Like, I don't care what they talking about. I don't care what you talking about. Like, just pull over. And we pulled over at the gas station and and walked back to the hotel. I, it's like she was tripping on some, on some next shit. Like, we was being followed or it was some gang shit going on. And we was like, look, let us out. Ain't nobody trying to hear that shit because now she acting weird. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? passing the hotel so it wasn't that far past the hotel but we probably walked back like a quarter mile like in the night like you know 2 a.m whatever whatever like man get us the fuck out of here you you weird you know what i'm saying so it, it even just that he wasn't famous then but when faced with an adverse situation or some weird shit we gonna keep it g we gonna you know like I was just going to tell her, yo, turn around. He was like, yo, pull over and let us out. And either way, I was fine. Come on, let's go. We out. Fuck this weird shit. Like, you know what I mean? So I think he was just a genuine person in terms of how he reacted to things was how he felt. You know what I'm saying? And different situations just, you know, defined him ultimately. But, you know, I, I think people have the right to feel what they feel and act the way they react, you know, depending on their life's experience and what they used to, you know what I'm saying? I didn't see it as such a big problem. I was just going to tell her, look, just make a U-turn right here. But he just blew up on her like, yo, just pull over. We getting out, man. Fuck this. What you talking about? You know what I'm saying? Woo, woo, woo. So 
We just got out and walked back to the hotel. Okay, well, after your second album, you ended up suing Profile Records. Yeah, that might have been after the first album, really. Was it? I don't remember the exact dates, but the problem arose. Let me tell you when the problem arose. In my first royalty period, I just came out of an accounting class. I knew what my contract said because I read it. And I knew how much I was supposed to make. So basically, if I got to, quote unquote, 500,000 records at 12%, I'm supposed to see over half a million dollars. Period. So when I go to collect my royalties, Corey's writing out the check and he kind of giggles and he's like, Man, I never had to pay this much money to somebody so young. And he gives me a check for like 120,000, something like that, around a little over 100,000. So I took the check and I'm looking at him like, yo, where's the rest? Like you bugging. I'm coming up here doing the math in my head, knowing I'm coming to pick up a half a brick. Like, where's my money, bro? So that's when the tension and the problem started because there's no way you spent $400,000 on anything. Not in those days, not with those videos, because I knew each video what it costs because I paid for it. I knew I kept on top of everything. I was an accountant, not by trade, but I just finished the fucking course. So I'm counting like, you know what I'm saying? I'm counting like a mathematician. I'm like, ooh, I just made a half a million dollars. And then I go up there and the man give me a little check for a hundred and something thousand. I, I felt disrespected. So that's when everything went left and I demanded the rest of my bread. I'm like, yo, I need my money, man. And I gave them due process and due time to give me the rest of my money and they did not. So that's when we went legal with it. And that's when we got into legal altercations because I demanded my bread. Like, it was either that. Really, I'm going to tell you, I was really on some street shit at that point, and I wanted to get at them. And once again, full circle, Run DMC came to visit me in my apartment, in my condo, in my co-op. And we was playing some beats, drinking some OE. I was probably smoking, like I do, some weed. And, um, you know, I had told them, I was like, yo, your boy owe me some bread and I want to do him something serious. And Run sat me down and was like, Ed, don't do it. He was like, it's not worth it. You're going to be, you're going to be bringing yourself down to their level. And you're going to change your life in a way that you're not going to be able to turn back from. You don't want to turn into that type of monster. You feel me? So just out of respect, because I knew that he expressed they did a, they did them the same way. So I'm like, well, if you could do the same thing to run DMC, then of course you're going to do it to a, who you, someone you consider a kid. So I had literally had to make two phone calls and be like, yo, chill. <laughs> Seriously. Shout outs to Run, man, Reverend Run. And he a reverend now, full circle. So, you know what I'm saying? Uh, that always stick in my head. Like, you know, if Run, if they did not come to my house, I don't know how I would be or where I would be. But I also knew to myself that I may not get my money. But at that point, I, th I thought that I wasn't going to get my money anyway. Oh yeah, man. The the amount of money that corporations have stolen from me pales in comparison. <laughs> it's so much more than than I ever lost selling drugs. Like, you know what I'm well, saying? That's... Like a hundred times more I've had a corporation steal from me legally. And there's nothing I could do about it. Right. Than than the little street dude that got me for the 17K. Like, you know what I'm saying? And right. it's and, and, and they can sit there and smile on your face. And you know exactly, and, and you have you, to tell you they're not going to pay you, and you have and to you, continue you go doing business. Process. You have to continue mm -hmm. doing business with them, and at exactly. the end of the day, 
if somebody on the street got me for three, four hundred thousand, man, there would be no oh, yeah. calling off. You feel me? Right. But these, you know, I just had to listen to my OG, take his advice, and and press on. You know what I'm saying? And and through the court system, I got some money back, but it was never what I anticipated from my career. It was like, I'm doing the math, bro. I'm great at math. So I'm knowing, okay, this is how much I'm getting. And it wasn't even a fraction of that. It was like a, a quarter of what I was getting. I, I'm going up there excited. You can imagine now, I'm a teenager. I'm like, I just hit the fucking lotto. I'm going to get paid. And I go up to the office and the man try to shit on me. And you do know that every dollar is like 50 cents. So between management, paying Howie T, production, this, that, and the third, it's like 50 cents on a dollar. So I'm doing the math on that too. And I'm like, yeah, for half a million, it sounds great. But now when you're dealing with 100,000, it's not that great. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I was, tor I was torn. Um, I was torn, you know what I'm saying, with that being said, you know. Well, that ended up kind of shelving your third album for a while because of this legal beef. So Absolutely. now you're delivering songs to them and they're not putting it out. So that's Absolutely. created that big gap between the second and third album. And we'll we'll get to that third album chronologically, but but that's what's happening right now. You're basically in label limbo where you can't put out music yourself under special ed, the solo artist. Absolutely. I couldn't put out records uh, because of my legal binding. That's why we went to court. So, you know, and then I, I, I'll tell you, I had a great relationship with uh, like Russell and Lior. I used to go see them all the time. They actually gave my management company a Rush Associated label, if anybody's familiar with that time period. So they used to call them a RAL. And, and and it was called True Blue Records. And um, it, their office was right next door to Russell's office and, and um, you know, on Elizabeth Street. So I used to go over there all the time and visit them and be like, yo, please get me off profile. And they were like, that's almost impossible. We can't even get Run DMC off a of profile. <laughs> right. I can't, we can't, I can't get my own brother off a of profile. Right. You feel me? So that's kind of how that situation went. And I used to, you know, they used to, I used to see them all the time. I walk in the office, I talk to them. Leo, I sit down with him. Like they always took meetings with me, even if it was just casual, me on the pass through. So, you know, shout outs to Russell and Leo and Def Jam, because that's really after my misfortune at Profile, that's where I wanted to go. But they couldn't, like they said, they couldn't even get Run DMC off the label because it was such an ironclad contract. And um, I, I fell under the same uh, circumstances. Okay, but then in 1994, the Crooklyn Dodgers came together. Yeah. You, Buckshot, Master Ace. Yes. Uh, which And it was produced by Q-Tip. Yeah, Q-Tip called and us. Spike had hired him to produce the track and recruit some Brooklyn artists. And he called me and um, I was happy to do it because this was uh, into the era where artists started collaborating. And I never really collaborated with anybody. So when I got the call to collaborate, I was like, hell yeah, let's do it. You know, and I felt the way even back when self-destruction was out. I wasn't on that. I wasn't called. I wasn't asked. So, you know, I always felt like, you know, when I'm going to get to collaborate with some somebody, you know what I mean? And then when Q-Tip called and was like, we're doing this Crooklyn soundtrack, I was happy. I was like, hell yeah, let's do it. And then he said he was considering Buck and Ace. And, you know, I was like, let's go. You know what I'm saying? So they came to my studio. I had a studio in Brooklyn called the Dollar Cab Lab. And um, they came over there and we started working on it. Tip was tightening up the track and we were writing to it. And um, it was good to go. It was a wrap from there. Well, what I never realized about this music video for that song was that there's a lot of cameos in the song with people that were born in Brooklyn. 
and you had Mike Tyson, which of course is Brownsville. Everyone knows that. Yeah. But I never realized that Michael Jordan was born in Brooklyn. He was in the music video. Yeah, Michael Jordan was born in Brooklyn. And you know, everybody want to claim Jordan. Y'all can have him. But he was born in Brooklyn, and he said it right. himself. So shout outs to MJ and um, Michael Jordan, that is, because there's a few MJs. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. And shout outs to Tyson, too, man. I mean, what was it like? Because at that point, Tyson and Jordan were like the biggest celebrities on earth, essentially. Athletes, yeah. Yeah. I mean, really more than just athletes, though. Celebrity, you, you can't yeah. even say, because people who never watched boxing or saw a single basketball game knew exactly who Jordan and Tyson were. Yeah, you're right, because I, n- I never really was a sports fan myself. I yeah. saw Tyson fight plenty of times, but I never really kept up with basketball or baseball or football because I was always grinding. I was outside. You know what I'm saying? I was working. I was traveling. So I never really had a big interest in watching a whole game. Shit was like hours. At least Tyson, I know he's going to knock somebody out quick and I can move on. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But to sit there and watch a whole game, that wasn't me. But I always knew all my people was like, yo, Jordan this, Jordan that. And actually, back in the days, um, we wanted a, an, a Nike deal. And we approached Nike and... Their response was, they don't endorse musicians. They only endorse athletes. However, they sent us boxes of clothes. So that's when I stopped wearing Nike. Yeah. So fast forward to 2023, Nike has a deal with Travis Scott. Nike has a deal with Drake. Right, and, with everyone. You know, and I'm sure there's more on the way as well. Right, but that was their position at that time. And they sent, yeah. trust me, they sent some boxes of clothing, and I wore some of the Jordans for a little bit, but I was never really a big Nike guy after that because I felt like that was a slap in the face. Like, why weren't we as rap artists good enough to get endorsement deals. Like, you know, it was ridiculous to me. And then not only that, but Adidas has entertainers and and artists. Reebok has rappers and and artists. Everyone else adapted the idea and they later on, I guess, adapted it themselves. But, you know, that was one of my experiences in dealing with the corporate world and endorsements and Nike and things of that nature. You and Biggie, uh, did you guys meet around this time or earlier? Well, I met Biggie through Klepto. Me and Klepto went to elementary school together as well. And um, I got a picture of us stunting in like fourth grade (laughs) with our button ups on, chilling by the school like gangsters. So, yeah, me and Klepto went to school together and as we grew up, we always, you know, kept in touch. We was always, you know, from the same area and also we came across each other, you know, and um, I was pretty like pretty much kind of popular in the neighborhood just from being an MC as well. And, you know, I had four older brothers and we were, we were all kind of like, you know, stand up people in our own way. So the whole, you know, we, we kept up with our school friends. So when he, uh, he used to hustle too, like, you know, clothes and shit like that and klepto, kleptomaniac. So yeah, yeah. So shout outs to Klep. So he came around one time to the Dollar Cab Lab and was like, yo, Ed, big gonna put us on. And I'm like, word? He's like, yeah, if you got any beats, you know what I'm saying? I was like, hell yeah, whatever you need, you my guy. But I was a little bit doubtful because I had already submitted some tracks for Big's album and they didn't use any. So I was like, all right, fuck it. Let's try it anyway. So he ended up bringing Big to the studio with uh, the rest of JM. And um, they listened to some beats and they started picking beats. And we was like, oh, hell yeah, yeah, go rap. And we had the own, our own studio, so it was nothing to be like, go spit on this. Go ahead, you like it, go spit on it. Go ahead. So we ended up doing three tracks. I know I had misquoted somewhere, I said it was two, but it was actually three. We did a song called Murder Ones, Mere Action Once Again. 
You know, Ak is my production partner. So between me and him, we do all the work together and put things together together. So we did Murder Ones, Lyrical Wizardry, and Oh My Lord. And Oh My Lord was the one that um, featured Klep and Biggie. And that was like a back and forth between Klep and Biggie. They was almost competing on that joint because Klep came off super, super tough on that song. And Big was like, oh, okay, okay. He had to kind of match his energy and his, his, his level of lyricism. So that was interesting. That was a fun time. Well, on the song, uh, Oh My Lord, there's a part of it that's like reversed. And when I looked it up, Biggie says, throw gas to Giuliani. Yeah. But on the album, it's like reversed. So you can't understand what it's saying. Like, what was it about that lyric that made it so weird? Well, at that time, you still have to remember there were some forms of censorship for political reasons. He talking about throwing guns to the mayor. You know what I'm saying? So in order to maybe get that song played <laughs> without getting it banned, you know what I'm saying, for being like anti-anything, we just figured let's just reverse that part right there. And mm -hmm. that was the only thing that would have been deemed super controversial because it was like uh, threatening a political figure. You know uh -huh. what I'm saying? Yeah. Were there any stories off camera? Because because Biggie was sort of a very special kind of artist. I remember when I interviewed C. Gutta, we talked about that line where he's like, yo, you know my man, Gutta kidnaps kids, fuck them in the ass and throw them over the bridge. <laughs> I remember Gutta was like, when he heard that, he was like, yo, man, you're making me sound like a pedophile here. Like, what the fuck? And, and I'm like, and, but he was like, Biggie, once he lays something down, doesn't matter whose feelings he hurts, he's not going to change it. He said for like three weeks, they, they were living together at the time, they would just walk past each other silently and not talk to each other <laughs> because Biggie would not change the lyric. Right. You know right. what I mean? No That's matter funny. what. That's uh, funny. Any sort of interesting Biggie stories during that era? Well, I think that recording, oh my Lord, just the competition between him and Klepp got a little intense with them trying to see, trying to one up each other. Because each verse was intense. So when Klepp laid his verse and everybody was like, ooh. And then Big go in there and lay a verse and it's like, ooh. And then Klepp go lay his verse and they like, ooh. And then Big had to go back again and top him. So they would try to one-up each other because they was both really super nice with the lyrics. Uh, but besides that, man, I mean, yeah, Big was just a charismatic dude, man. He was just, you know... Uh, well loved and and um, revered at the same time. What what stood out to me a lot, I guess, was um, one time he brought Faith to the studio, like, and she spent the whole time on his lap. <laughs> like I was like, uh, okay. <laughs> I mean, it was cute and all that, but to me, it was just like, all right, you know, y'all gonna work, y'all gonna do this, or, you know, it was unusual. I would say, because you there with the whole JM, me, I'm there, my whole crew, this, that, and the third, probably like, you know, 15 people in the studio, minimum, and the whole time she's just glued to his lap, you know what I'm saying? So I was like, all right, cool, no problem, you know what I'm saying? You love it, I love it, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Shout outs to Faith. I mean, there, there's always going to be a debate who's the greatest rapper. And, you know, a lot of people would choose Tupac based on the message and the the energy and the emotion that, that's put into it. But I, I think that most, you know, serious hip hop heads like me and you, in terms of lyricism and putting words together, most people would give it to Biggie in terms of just the the craftsmanship of of rapping. Being in the studio with him and producing for him, what was it about Biggie that was just different than any other rapper? Um, I don't know. I think that, I'm going to be honest, I think that because of his past and, and because of Puffy's love of marketing and legacy, I think they kind of like, um, you know, got it to where that became the status quo. But Biggie was nice. Biggie was another nice rapper. I don't think he had enough uh, albums to make those claims. 
Yeah. You know, he was a very great artist, you know, spit, his flow. It kind of reminded me of myself, at, at, you know, at times. But, um, you know, and Pac, Pac was a great artist, too. And I witnessed him, you know, once again in my studio as well, writing and, and doing his thing. But I think that, um, you know, just because of both of them passing, everyone kind of, for one, pit them against each other lyrically and for two, exalt them up to this phenomenal level of l lyricism. And, you know, they both were great in their own way and in their own right. You know, they both had different styles too. So I would just say that, um, you know, props to both of them for being great lyricists. You know, you can't deny that they were both great. It's just um, how, you, how you perceive yourself and them as artists, you know what I'm saying? Okay, and then that same year, Shaq ended up redoing one of your songs, I Got It Made, to Shaq's Got It Made on the yeah. Shaq Fu, the return album. Absolutely, Shaq Fu. And, um, you know, let's just say that I don't know if Profile cleared what or what or what, but a lot of artists have kind of redone my songs, whether it be Jill Scott or Rick Ross or Shaq. And, you know, I don't really see the great financial gain from that. Like, <laughs> and I've approached a few of them and even even Puff, like I called him one time and he told me, you know, he paid, his lawyers paid for that already. And I'm like, so nobody ain't called me, but, you know, I guess legally they go about it the legal way and go to the administrators. And uh, which would be profile record. So, in 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 some ways, it's a it's an honor. It's you know I'm humbled and honored that so many artists, um, you know, look up to me in that sense and pay homage to me in that sense. I just wish that I could have gained financially from it. You know what I'm saying that would have been an icing on the cake. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I feel you. Well, by 1995, after three years of legal back and forth, the profile, you guys finally settled. And instead of having four more albums left on profile, it got cut, cut down to two more albums. And then finally, your third album, Revelations, comes out. But five years had passed between your second and third album. And, you know, I mean, especially back then, that was like, that's like 100 years in hip hop years. Yeah. Yeah, everything changed. So many artists came out. The trends changed. Everything changed. So it was uh, a challenge in that respect. Just, you know, and, and, and the shift of hip hop moved around from region to region. You know, you had New York uh, in the glamour of hip hop and the height of it all. And then you get California. They had their time. Then you get Miami. They had their time. St. Louis they had their time. Even Ohio with Bone Thugs, they had, and, and um, the other group, uh, I forget the name of the group, but every region and every city gets their time. And then Atlanta, Atlanta gets their time. So it moved around and shifted to where it's as even if we came out, we weren't in the hot lava bubbling section. You know what I'm saying? During that time. And that has a lot to do with it. Um, and if every anyone can look back at the history, they'll see where that heightened success and that energy shifted from region to city to city for a period of time. And um, that's really kind of how it went. It was almost like trending, you know, what was trending. And, um, you know, we, we dealt with it. We dealt with the whole Miami resurgence or surge from Miami, St. Louis with the Saint with Nelly and all of them. And um, then you get the other groups that come out of these areas too at the same time and they begin to kind of bubble. Then we get a little, even North Carolina had a little, a little time here. You know what I'm saying? Um, it, it went around. You just had to kind of watch it and understand what was happening. And, and, it, and all right, I mean, everyone, everywhere, uh, everyone deserves to get shine where it's due. But I think they did it in such a regional, trendy way that, you know, if you don't catch the wave, then you just kind of like there. You know what I mean?
Well, at the end of that year, 95, Tupac is shot at Quad Studios. Mm -hmm. And then he was also facing the, the rape charge, and he ends up going to prison. Yeah, that was Were a you lot. in contact with him during that time leading up to his, his prison sentence? I lost contact with him about that time. I, after, see, our our thing was more personal. We didn't do a lot of social going out at that point. Our thing was he would come to the studio and record. He would come to where I am. It was almost like a more personable vibe than, yo, I'm at this club. Let's go to the club. It was like, yo, I'm coming over to the studio. Yo, come on. Yo, we over here. All right, come on. You know what I'm saying? It was just a matter of fact that he happened to be shooting juice and I was like, fuck it, let's go chill and go sit up on the set for a minute. You know what I'm saying? So that was just a random, but most of the time it was more personable. So by that time, we kind of didn't, uh, you know, didn't have as much communication then. And I think it was a thing where the he became more popular and started to kind of give everybody a little time, go hang out here, go hang out there. I know he was hanging out with Biggie and them. You know, he had different friends and different groups of friends. And, um, you know, at that time he was just out on the town, painting the town. Okay, so he ends up going to prison. And then that next year he gets out. And all hell starts to break loose. The whole East Coast, West Coast beef got coined by Vibe Magazine. So that created a really messed up energy in the hip hop world because it really wasn't East Coast, West Coast. It was really Suge and Puffy and Pac and Biggie and a lot of these, it wasn't even real issues. It was just egos or flaring out of control. That and the media, like you said, like I remember we were at the Source Awards when it got sticky. And I remember I was there with, shit, I was there with a whole bunch of dudes, like uh, 20, about 20 low lowlifes. And we were up in the, we were right in front of death row and chilling. And um, I remember because I gave up my seat to, uh, who I gave up my seat to, he passed away. Nate Dog. Nate Dog was there with his lady, his wife, whatever. And we just came in and took two rows. We didn't even know who's like, we didn't care. We just took two rows. And then Nate Dog came and was like, you know, with an usher. And the usher was like, this is their seat. And when I look up, I saw it was Nate Dog. I was like, oh, all right. I got up just because it was him, because we wasn't about to get up for nobody. But he, it was him and he was there with his lady. You know what I'm saying? So I was like, nah, all due respect. We, we, we love genuinely, we love West Coast artists. We love artists from everywhere. I mean, we went to go see like Snoop at uh, Trafalgar Square or one of these spots in Queens, like just on the humble. Like we really was into all of that, you know? Um, it was never no beef like that. That was all created by the media. So anyway, shit, I gave up my seat for for Nate Dogg and his his lady. And um, you know, I ain't had no problem with that. But I told the ushers, don't come back over here. You know what I'm saying? I we took I, I gave them their seat, took another seat. Yo, don't come back over here. I don't care who's who's whose it is. You know what I'm saying? So that's how we did that. And then um what happened was they sent Tupac out on stage at the wrong time. I think it was supposed to be a Tribe Called Quest or somebody's award, but they played Tupac's music and sent him out on stage. It was really some really unprofessional, random shit that happened. And everybody was kind of like confused and even Pac was confused. So when he got into that situation, he commented on it and was like, yo, y'all the one boop, 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 sent me out here, was playing my song and all that. Like, what the fuck? You know what I mean? Like, it was because of their unprofessionalism that it got so tense. 
Now, I don't know what Suge and Puff had. That's between them. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, I remember that situation where they sent Pac out on stage at the wrong moment, with the wrong cue. And that caused some tension because it was like, the fuck going on? You know what I'm saying? Well, yeah, he snatched the mic uh, from Q-Tip, I think. And then that caused a bit of a friction. And yeah, I mean, it was the whole thing was a mess. You know, the, the Source Awards are legendary <laughs> for the uh, the bullshit that's occurred. You know, yes. I mean, I don't think any award show will ever reach the height. You know, down to Suge's speech, you know, all you artists out there <laughs> who don't want the CEO all up in the videos, come to death row. Yeah, he um, was there. Okay, so Tupac joins Death Row and he drops Hit Him Up, which arguably is the greatest diss song of all time because he took it three steps higher than anyone else. He starts it off, that's why I fucked your bitch. You know, it got super personal and so forth. And you're friends with Pac and Biggie and Junior Mafia. Mm Mm-hmm. So when you heard this, what did you think? This is a mess. Mm. This fucked up. And I really, in my mind, I was looking at, I was blaming the source and the media for doing that shit. Because I'm like, y'all bring all these people here together and then act real unprofessional and do some unprofessional shit. Pit people against each other and then put out headlines. You know, kind of like the way the internet does now with the clickbait. You know, they put up headlines and make it so, you know what I'm saying? To where that's how people feel. And then people start feeling a way and giving it energy and giving it life. Well, beefs happen in hip hop and people work it out. People do songs together, whatever else, Mm -hmm. but... In 1996, after Hit Him Up comes out, Tupac gets killed in Las Vegas. When you heard that news, what'd you think? I was fucked up because it was real. Like, my man died. Like, you had to get the news that somebody you you was good with, chill with, had love for, died. And over what? You know what I'm saying? That was the next question. Like, well, what happened? So... It all looked to everybody like it was gang related, like it was because of the um, the mash out on old boy. And that's what everything seemed to be. So we were just like, man, that's fucked up. When you look at what's happening right now in 2023, uh, Keefe D just got arrested for his involvement in the Tupac murder. And uh, my interview with him from four years ago basically laid out the entire story. Mm -hmm. and, you know, got it on the radar of millions of people, including Las Vegas PD. If Keefe gets convicted of this, is there any closure for you with your friend being gone, or does it just another person going to prison? Well, there's some closure. Um, However, it seems as if everybody knew all of this you know, on the streets or all along anyway, you know what I'm saying? And I was, I'm confused because I had no idea. You know, I guess I'm not from that part of town or whatever, but in my opinion, I really don't even understand that because you talked yourself into a, into prison, bro. Like, how does that work? Well, he wrote a book. Yeah, not just talk, but wrote right. a book. Yeah. So People this like is to blame saying, me, but... At the end of the day, my interview hey, listen, was based on his listen. book. Listen, the blame is on the man confessing, period. Like, if you did whatever you did, bro, you, you a gangster, you don't talk, right? Like, you know, you take that to your grave. You know what I'm saying? If you made some agreement, shit, you got to get out of jail free card. Take that to your grave. You know what I'm saying? You don't come out here and start, like, Bro, I don't even understand that. I'm from a whole different, maybe I'm from a different mind state. You know what I'm saying? I'm from a whole different kind of gangster. I don't understand that. That I just don't understand it. I don't understand how that whole thing unfolded. That's that's mind blowing to me, bro. If 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 I avoided going to prison, I'm a 
You understand? I'm gonna shut the fuck up. Period. Well, then one year later, your friend, once again, Biggie, he gets killed in Los Angeles. Terrible, horrible. And, you know, let me just say, man, like, we have to stop killing our black leaders. And even though you just look at these people as celebrities, they leaders in their communities. They're leaders in other communities. They're, they're setting an example of success. They're, man, they're taking people out of poverty. We can't continue killing our leaders. Like, and let's not, let's not stop there. Like, they assassinate a lot of artists at this point. Like, you don't have to die to be famous. And I keep saying that. Like, that's what I teach these kids, man. You do not have to die to be famous. That's why I have a nonprofit organization, Special Ed Arts and Literacy. And that's my whole point in doing all of this is because it's getting real uh, deadly out here and tumultuous for our youth, our children. These people are teenagers. You understand? And they out here murdering each other. This is sad. This is sad. It's biblical. You understand? This is biblical. So they murdered Pac. They murdered Biggie. They murdered Pop Smoke. They murdered Nipsey Hussle. They murdered PNB Rock. They just murdering people left and right. And it's not just one place. They murder Offset over here. They murder Young Cheese. I mean, they're targeting someone with any kind of success. And that's not fair. That's not fair to the growth of their careers to their families, to their, you know, to their children. Like, we can't behave like this as a culture, as a people, period. We have to stop that. It's not even, you know, the, the CIA assassinating us no more. We assassinating ourselves within our own culture. Like, this is unacceptable. And um, something got to give, man. I mean, yeah, the number of rappers that I have interviewed that have died violently is absolutely mind-blowing when I think about it. From Mo3 to Young Greatness to Chink's Drugs to BTB Savage, who died a couple days after we released our interview. Like, it, it's just, no, I don't think I could go into any other genre and do this many interviews and have that many people die. In it's, any other genre, not in country, not in rock, not in R&B, not in business, not not in sports. You know, I've interviewed tons of athletes, it's tons un, from Rodman to Tyson. None of them die violently after the interview. But in hip hop, here we are. I talked to Pop Smoke a couple of days before he got killed. We were planning an interview like it's it's really just crazy and, and sad. I'll tell you what it is, uh, Vlad. It's programming. We've been programmed to not value our own lives. We've been programmed to murder each other. We're being programmed by even by ourselves, admissibly. It's like we're getting the bag and being paid to make content that is detrimental to our own existence. We're programming our own children to hate themselves and to not value our lives. Yet we value the lives of everyone else, even dogs, even animals. You can't say nothing about no other race, no animals, no nothing, but you could kill a nigga all day on record and, and go to number one. You could get a Grammy for that. So that is the problem. And this is systematic and it has been going on for decades. It has been going on for decades. So after a, a certain time, some of these artists and these children are born into this. They're born into a climate where we have no value for our lives. We have no value for ourselves. We have no value for our women. And we just all around no value at all. We're, we're valueless. We're like empty. 
empty souls and, and the music is perpetuating this message over and over. Well, yeah, I remember I just interviewed Leor Cohen and I had been talking about this for the, about the past year. So I brought it up to him as well because it hits close to him with being the co-founder of 300. And I said, look, you have all these crazy lawsuits that happen. You know, uh, you know, a mass shooter shoots from a hotel, the hotel gets sued and they have to pay $100 million to the victims and so forth. When you look at some of these artists that come out, you know, like a young thug and so forth, who are, you know, dissing their enemies and talking about violent acts that some of which is based on reality, do you think at one point the victims are going to start suing the major record labels and saying, you guys are promoting and marketing these lyrics and making these artists big, which is causing actual violence. And if one or two of these labels get sued, will that make all these labels say, we're just going to stick to a different genre from now because this is too financially risky for us to do. And his answer, I mean, listen, he's political. He said, well, I just feel the legal system is messed up in this country and, and so forth. He didn't, he didn't, you know, necessarily want to address that. And I understand why. He's the head of YouTube Music Global, right? But I honestly think that's what it's going to take, where at one point, Universal is going to get sued because of something they put out. And that's going to make everyone say, okay, we can't stop this genre, but it's going to have to turn into an independent genre. It's no longer going to be a major corporate, corporately endorsed genre, just like, you know, Pepsi or the Super Bowl is not going to put up someone talking about killing people in, in a commercial. Correct. You see what I'm saying? And and you do have a point there. And I agree. I agree there needs to be accountability from the people that are investing into these artists that are backing them, supporting them, signing them, and being a part because they're being a part of this conspiracy. So yeah. they have to be accountable. That's the only way. Um, otherwise, everyone's just profiting from it. And that's going to continue. So we have to find a way as a culture to to stop it or else it's not going to stop. No one's stopping and no one's saying anything. And once again, that's why I'm out here doing what I do. That's why I go to the schools. I talk to the kids because if I don't, who's going to? Who's going to explain to them that this is not what hip hop is about? Respect yourselves, loves yourselves. Like, there's no message of positivity going out there that's being exalted, uplifted, or broadcasted or marketed. Everything being marketed is surrounding death and destruction. Well, and that brings me to my next point, because you were on Drink Champs, and you said NWA brought the age of destruction. And a lot of people, particularly other rappers, particularly other West Coast rappers, had a problem with it. But when I first heard it, I said, yeah, I, I see where he's coming from. You know, me personally, I was like, yeah, I, I, I think that's a fair statement. And I remember I even interviewed Alonzo from the World Class Wrecking Crew, who was, you know, Dr. Dre and DJ Yellow's original group. And, you know, and a lot of those NWA records were done at his house and everything else like that. And he told me flat out in our first interview, he's like, look, when, you know, he was promoting a lot of shows in L.A., he said, look, when I was first promoting shows in L.A., yeah, some gangsters would be in the crowd. And, yeah, you know, sometimes stuff would happen. There'd be some gang shit, whatever else. But after N.W.A. came out and became uber popular, it'd be like 80 percent gangsters in these shows. And all hell would break loose on a regular basis. You can't say that N.W.A. had absolutely no role in this. Although people argued with you that you were completely wrong. When you look at the effects that N.W.A. had in terms of gangster rap, not only affecting the music, but also affecting the communities mm -hmm. and so forth, well, what do you think about it? Well, I'm going to tell you a little story. When I first got into the club business, 1979, now first of all, gangs have been around forever in Los Angeles. Yeah. Gangs had different reasons for existence. Some gangs started off to fight uh, white people. Some gangs were uh, designed to fight the police in the community because what we're experiencing right now is nothing new. It's just, uh, it's just being televised more. So the ratio of gangbangers to civilians 
was minuscule uh, in the early 70s and uh, early 80s, late, late okay. 70s, early 80s, okay? Yeah. Right after NWA, now I've been in the club business all this time, and I stopped making records. I started, went back to my second career, which is nightclub owner. What happened was um, NWA and rec or gangster rap made gangster lifestyle cool. So the ratio started to change. Everybody was a gangbanger. It used to be 5% gangbanger, okay? Because gangbangers, once upon a time, had a cold. They, you, had, you just couldn't have a gun. You had to be able to fight. You had to have something to bring to the hood other than a pistol. Well, mm -hmm. at some point in time, when the dope and... When the dope and the uh, gang banging became profitable, everybody became a gang banger. So now you got 95% gangsters or 90% gangsters and 10% 10 percent civilians. And when that happened, everything everything went crazy because now theaters, clubs, um, parking lots, the park, everything is a war zone. Well, I would like to say that none of those people were actual members of NWA. So for them to have an opinion was just like me having an opinion. Okay, so let's start there. Secondly, I did have a discussion with Cube and he understands where I'm coming from and I understand where he's coming from. They say that they were just making, I wouldn't say parody, but records for the hood, selling out the trunk. It wasn't intended for global scale marketing, but that's what that's where it was taken. Well, well, I mean, listen, the original records is true, but Straight Outta Compton was a major release right. that went number Afterwards. one. Afterwards, Every, everyone knew, everyone knew by the time Straight Outta Compton was so eagerly anticipated by hip hop fans that you're not saying you can't say this is out the trunk anymore. Right. Well, they have to take some accountability, but. At the end of the day now, did once again, we go back to the labels. Now, it's, it's, it comes to a point where the labels are paying artists to emulate this, paying the artists in this genre, paying the artists to send these messages out, to continue, because they did see the effect that it had, just like they saw the effect that empowerment of the conscious music had. The conscious music had an effect. You saw the people walking around with African pride, black pride, medallions, the gear, uh, self-worth and value. But then when you had the market for those records and the gangster shit, you saw the results of that as well. So yes, music does affect people it does contribute to people's behavior and the outcome. And it's the same thing we're saying now. It has evolved. So from that point until now, it's no longer just that simple. Now it's straight murder music. Now it's drill music. Now it's people directly attacking each other through the music and that music being supported by these same labels and, and, and record companies. So there has to be accountability like, it's like I say, I stop. I started dealing with reality and I stopped lying. I stopped lying to myself for one. And then with that being said, if you're not lying to yourself, then you shouldn't be lying to nobody else. So if we're all dealing with reality and our conscience and facts, then we have to look at it for what it is. They are encouraging us and paying us to be destructive, you know, and that's systematic. I think that's part of, you know, a plan of sorts. That's part of an agenda is for us to take ourselves out so we don't have to do it. You understand? That's real. That's that's real programming. It's systematic and it has been going on for decades now. Over 30 years now, we've been getting more and more destructive. Yeah, no, listen, you're right. I, I remember the first person uh, to comment about your statement was Exhibit. He said, man, that's my family tree right there. Don't go out, you know, I don't go out of my way to discourage people from expressing their opinions about hip hop, but fuck this shit, special ed, you out of pocket. Don't make it hard for yourself. We still active, bro. And when I read that, I'm like, man, Exhibit 49 that's, years old. That's comedy. Like, well, why is he saying we still active and putting out this veiled threat? 
Like, come on, man. Like, yeah, that's that's comedy. That's not a threat to me. That's a joke. Right. I, I was really just like, and I, I didn't even exhibit, respond like, because there's on, no man. need like, to. Like, cut it out. Cut it out. The, the only response I had was a short giggle. <laughs> like, I'm I was sure in no. going to be mad at me, but he was already mad at me last I checked, so I don't really care. But, but my whole thing is like, yo, this is this man's opinion, and you can't say he doesn't know hip hop. He doesn't know the history of hip hop. He was there from the very beginning. He was there before. Really, all the people that have commented about it, from Exhibit to Killer Mike to the Dog Pound to whatever, nobody was making records as long as Special Ed has been making records. Shout out to all these guys who I know personally, me and Killer Mike talk, me and Daz talk. But at the end of the day, yo, you're allowed to have this opinion and it is based on actual things. And I don't completely agree with it, but I also don't completely disagree with it. You know, and uh, it, it was interesting to see the kind of reaction from one little part from a two and a half hour interview. Right. Exactly. They didn't they, they didn't take into context what my whole journey and my mission was and what I was talking about the whole time. They only took one comment and dragged it out of proportion. And then they did the same thing following up because the dog pound. I've been working with them over the whole last year on unifying the East and the West Coast and stopping the violence. And this came after the shooting and killings of Nipsey and PNB Rock and Corrupt and I talk all the time. So they even took our phone call and edited that and made that look like it was combative. When they was calling to tell me that they love me, for one, that I ain't got no problems and that I'm with them. They was like, yo, you with us, cuz. Like, that's what they was calling to tell me. That was the crux of it. But the media took a sentence or another part of the conversation, because we was just really having a personal conversation. But Big A felt like we should organically capture this so that the streets can understand and see where we're coming from. Because we've been on FaceTime for like a year. We do these calls all the time. Like, Corrupt will call me with like 10 people on the phone. We're like, you know, all on FaceTime. The same thing you saw was the same thing we do all the time. And we talk as men, you know what I'm saying? And nothing about that conversation was disrespectful towards me or towards them. But by the time another media outlet chop it up, it appears as if there's some discord. And it wasn't. They was calling to tell me, yo, Ed, you know, we've been hearing the West been talking. We want to make sure you are all right and... You know what I'm saying? Let you know you got love. We love you, homie. Like, you know, that type of thing. And, you know, you with us, you with us. Like, that's really what they were saying. Like, and, and it got turned upside down. So this is the whole thing about the clickbait. This is the whole thing about media. Like, when somebody wants you to click onto their stuff so they can get those numbers up, that's what they do. They'll slap on their own headline. And, and make it into, you know, some controversy because controversy sells. You know what I'm saying? But, yeah, I didn't respond to none of that other stuff because, for one, none of those other third-party artists were even even existed when this all started. And, and not one of them was even in NWA. So I don't even care about what they're talking about. Like, they are relevant, period. You know what I'm saying? I I care about what... The actual members had to say, and I spoke with Arabian Prince. I spoke with, did I speak with Yella? We communicated. I spoke with the DOC. Mm -hmm. Me and the DOC is, you know, we 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 tight, we good. You yeah, know what I'm that's saying? What I meant. Yeah. So I spoke with actual members, and then I got on JD's platform with Ice Cube. So that's where it matters to me. I don't care what no third, fourth generation fools talking about. Like they ain't got nothing to do with me. And and I'm gonna tell you on a personal level, the reason why it's personable and affect me that way is because I have a nephew, he talking about Crippin. I got a cousin, he talking about he a blood. You know what I'm saying? I got family members talking about, and they ain't never been to California. So they representing something they have no parts in or no origination in. And I don't mind 
you and your block rep your set and do what you want. That's your block, though. When you start taking that to other communities and other children are being affected and killing each other over it. I'm saying we're going to speak about that. And that's what I do. I go out and I speak to children. I go to schools. I go to schools on all levels, elementary, junior high, high school. And I talk to them and I let them know what hip hop is about and what hip hop is not about. And the perspective, they out here being ultra hyper violent, ultra hypersexual, like even the sexualization of our women. Like I'm seeing these artists come out and they're promoting promiscuity and ratchet behavior. And that's unacceptable. Like that's really unacceptable. Well, yeah. And if you think about how step by step it became more and more serious, you know, NWA came out and they're talking about gang banging, but no one's actually claiming a set. No one, you know, Easy es not saying he's a Kelly Park Crip or, or whatever else. But then DJ Quick comes out and now he's claiming a certain Pyru blood set. So that gets escalated. You know, you fast forward to Chicago, suddenly people are talking about smoking their dead enemies. You know, people are going filming music videos at graveyards and, you know, disrespecting tombstones. And, you know, people's mothers are getting shot and killed. And, you know, it's like it's growing. It, it has to with the Internet, especially because there's no. You know, there's no barrier to entry to getting your word out. Like Tupac had to go to a studio, record, hit him up, submit it to Jimmy Iovine. You know, Interscope had to agree to put it out. They had to press it up, commercially release it. A bunch of time passes to the point where someone goes, ah, you know, something, never mind. You know, yeah, I, I just, just scrapped that. I, I, I've calmed down now. You know, I've sobered up. I don't want this record to come out. This week or two that it takes for it to get properly released, I've changed my mind. Let's just scrap it. Now, a person goes in, tweets, says something, makes a video. Within 30 seconds, millions of people are now watching it. You can't take it back. And now you deal with the repercussions of what happens. And you have to out ignorant the other person in order to get that extra attention. And... You know, I mean, even in my life, the type of shit that people have said about me is just like, you got to be kidding me right now. Like the, the argument, the disagreement that me and this person had had absolutely no bearing to how far they take are taking it now. But but this is just the reality of where we are. And listen, I think NWA has to take a certain amount of responsibility for that. Was there systematic racism? Absolutely. Was there drugs being put in the community? Absolutely. Was the government and the CIA and COINTELPRO and everything else like that involved? 100%. But that doesn't eradicate the piece that NWA played. And I think that your point is valid. And if no one else agrees with you, I'm going to agree with you. Well, I think that there are many, many, many people that agree. So, you know, I'm, I'm cool. I'm I'm pretty much understand what I'm trying to say. If someone else doesn't understand what I'm trying to say, then that's on them. You know what I'm saying? I'm not blaming them as being the catalyst for everything going on. What I'm saying is when that was approved, when they were approved and given the thumbs up to go, and then it gave everyone else the thumbs up to go. And now when everyone else gets the thumbs up to go, it gets escalated throughout the years, throughout the years to where the level of homicides and the level of disrespect between artists, you know what I'm saying, is at an all time high. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's self-evident, you know what I'm saying? And, and like I said, man, before, no disrespect to them. Like I was going, I came out here to sign the Dre to Aftermath uh, when he left death row. I stayed at the Le Mans for three months. I was going to ask you about that. Cause yeah. I remember hearing the rumor that special ed is, is working with Dr. Dre. So yeah. that's true. Yeah. I came out here. Yeah. He brought me out here right after he left death row and it, it was heat. It was whatever the climate was, but I came out here. I wasn't going to be on some gangster shit or make gangster records. 
he wanted special ed. So I was coming out here as special ed to get into a deal with that situation. I stayed over at the Lamontros for like three months. You know what I'm saying? And then I went home for my daughter's birthday. And when I went home, that's when um, I think Pac died that time. Yep, I think Pac, Pac died that time. And shit just turned upside down and the deal fell through. And I went so went through some other stuff too. I had an attorney that uh, ran off with bread, like a corrupt attorney. Yo, I done been through a lot in this industry. You know what I'm saying? And I had to deal with that. I had to get the I had to get her disbarred through the bar association. I did that myself. Like it's been a lot. It's been a long journey for me, man. Like I've had to go through a lot of adversities and a lot of technicalities and procedures, you know, just to get justice for myself and others. Because she did it to a lot of people, man. I had a um, attorney that shit ran off with a lot of money from not just myself but other clients. You know what I'm saying? I've had the, I, I've even gained relationships because of that. Other clients that, you know, we all face this and trying to go after her, go after the money, you know. But, you know, I, I just did what I could, man. I called the Bar Association, got a disbarred, and moved on with my life. You know, you can't just live in that stuff forever. It'll eat you, it'll eat you apart, you know. Well, Special Ed, this is a conversation that started 21 years ago. And uh, at the time, I didn't even have any big mixtapes out, much less there was no Vlad TV. There was, you know, you know, I was relatively unknown. And like you said in the beginning, you invited me into your home in Brooklyn and we sat there and we chopped it up and you were very respectful and I was a big fan. And having that conversation with someone in such a personal manner always stuck in me and, you know, gave me a passion for these types of hip hop stories. And the fact that I actually have a platform now where this is not a wasted interview like last time, that a lot of people are gonna get to see it. I truly appreciate you coming in. I've been a fan since I got it made. Once again, one of the greatest hip hop beats of all time. Uh, a timeless song, other timeless uh, pieces of music that you've had. The impact, you know, down to, to Jay-Z actually quoting you on the uh, Bitch Don't Kill My Vibe remix. I'm the highest, the highest title, numero uno, kill my vibe, that's your motherfucking funeral. You and know, you know that's Jay-Z did, quoting you and flipping it a little bit. Yeah, he shouted me out on the New York, too. Shout out to Special oh, right, 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 right. Made. Exactly. Yeah, man, shout out to Jay-Z, man. I'm going to shout him right back out. <laughs> Holla at your boy. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, it's just it's just an honor, man, to just be um, loved and, and quoted. And, you know, um, a, a, imitation is, is the highest form of uh, flattery and all that. So for all the artists that have sampled me, went on to, you know, do my records over in whatever capacity, borrowed lyrics. That's all an honor for me, man. And, you know, I just appreciate it all. You know, nowadays for me, I'm more into um, just trying to go back and help these kids, you know, with my organization. It's called SEAL, Special Ed Arts and Literacy. And the website is specialedartsandliteracy.org. So, you know, I go around to the schools and talk to them and try to redirect them from maybe the wrong path that they're on. You know, um, that's my mission right now. I don't really, really care too much about what's going on in the streets and what artists are doing and, you know, the mess that they making. I'm trying to clean up the mess. So any of y'all successful artists out there that want to donate or do something for your communities, Y'all holler at me, y'all donate the seal. And and I'm I'm the one out there going to the schools in New York, you know what I'm saying, in Baltimore, in Chicago, in wherever. I go everywhere. And um that's my life's mission now. I've been doing music for over 35 years. At this point, I want to stop these young kids from going out there and crashing. You feel me? So that's what I'm doing right now with my organization, sealartsandliteracy.org. You know what I'm saying? 
Absolutely, man. A very dope concept. I'm looking at the website right now, uh, sealartsandliteracy.org. Um, you know, and, and I just want to say before we go that you and I, I'm 50, you're 51, I believe. Like, it's a gift to get to this age and still look the way you and I look. Absolutely. You know yeah, I, mean? I just turned Healthy, 51. Thin. Yeah. Nice skin. We have all our teeth. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, I... there's lots of people, number one, that we both knew that didn't make it to this point because of decisions they made in terms of their lifestyle or their ego or their anger or whatever. There's lots of people that are still alive but are in horrible shape. You know, I have a friend that's missing half his teeth because of a lifetime of, of drug use. You know, this life is a long journey. And I've always planned 10 years ahead with everything I did. You know, I, I knew that in my 30s, I got to get to my 40s. In my 40s, I got to get to my 50s. I'm, I'm planning for my 60s and 70s right now. And if you plan ahead and you don't just live life, you know, YOLO, and you only live once, you could have a long and fruitful and successful life and really enjoy the fruits of your labor to get to this point. Because it's great, man. I'm, I love being this age. And a lot of the young kids would be like, oh, man, you are old heady. No, man, like y'all haven't experienced the shit that I have and what Ed has. And that's because we took our lives seriously. And Absolutely. here we are in our 50s, successful, healthy. We have families. And it's something that wasn't done by accident. We all planned to get here. Absolutely. And I'm glad to see you looking the way you look right now. I appreciate that, man. That just came from me gaining knowledge of self, man. And at, at one point, even as a youth, I started to eat properly and eat healthy. And I grew up in a family where we actually cooked and cooked healthy foods. Well, so to speak, I became more healthy from that. So from all the grease and the red meat and this and that, you know, I stopped eating pork when I was a child. You know, I stopped eating beef. I'm very particular about what I consume you know, the fried foods, et cetera. And then drinking. I don't drink nonsense, no bunch of soda. I don't drink alcohol at all. You know what I'm saying? I try to keep it as healthy and natural as possible. Just, you know, and with me stop smoking, it's all so that I can have a longer life and a more fruitful life and not, you know, push myself into sickness or death at my own choice. You know, it's the choices we make the things we consume and jest, et cetera. So we just have to make better decisions as people and know the consequences of our decisions, you know? And um, that's it, man. That's why I, I kind of don't mind missing out on some of the stuff that's happening and going on because I've been running up and down and traveling for 35 years. Like, that's not, it doesn't really excite me the way it may other people, you know, people want to jump into the game and, you know, that's their goal, man. I've been flying since you could smoke on a plane. Like I've smoked a, a Newport on a plane before. That's how long I've been flying. So, you know, nowadays I just kind of kick back. I'm into a, a lot more TV and film production. You know, I actually was a producer on the ladies first that came out on Netflix uh, recently, yeah, mm. I I, um, nice. I was a consultant producer on that project. You know, um, shout outs to all the ladies on there. I'm very proud of you all. And um, I've been doing some executive production on the print shop, you know, concert series. That's a real um, holistic uh, view of like live performances. I did one myself. That's online. I've done some documentaries. Um, just in terms of the arts and literacy. I've done some documentaries on that. I've done documentaries on mental health. I won some independent film festival music awards. Shouts out to one of my partners, Sebastian Foxworthy, you know. Just doing that gives me um, more, it's more rewarding when I can do something that helps others and mean something, you know, something more meaningful and positive than contributing to destruction and death. Like, I, I can't do that no more. Like, uh, that's why I don't really even 
worry about making records or trying to put this out or that out, man. I'm over 50 now. I got younger artists, you know, shout out to City the Great. I teach him how to be an entrepreneur. You know what I mean? I teach him how to run his uh, record label, how to choose his singles, put his videos out, market, et cetera, et cetera, and give him whatever platforms or opportunities I can. I'm about helping others right now. Like you can help yourself all you want, but if you're not helping others, you know, what are you really doing out here? You know, that's what it is. Special ed, man. Truly an honor to finally sit down. I feel like this came at the exact right time. You know, we've been talking about doing this for some years, but yeah, right now is the perfect time for this to happen, man. And thank you so much for coming in. And, you know, you and I are in touch already. So let's just keep in touch and see what else we could do in the future. Absolutely. Amen, Vlad. It's a pleasure, man. And yes, good sir. to see you. Congratulations on your success, man. Thank you, man. Till next time. Peace. Amen. Yes, sir.